What I'm going to talk uh, now has some connection, invisible connection with the previous, uh, my predecessor, the previous speaker, about the flower and the tree and the silent mode of experiencing the object. So there's some kind of resonance with that kind of thinking in my paper. Uh, in this paper, I am concerned mainly with three things. First, I want to comment upon the general impact of communication technologies on human mind and intelligence. Secondly, I would like to point out the impact of the study on the humanities now. And finally, I'll talk briefly about the importance of Kurzybiski's notion of abstracting as a possible antidote to the effect of these technologies on creative impulse. In concluding paragraph, I'll speak if I have the time, a few words about the work we have been doing and the two research centers in Baroda, Center for Contemporary Theory and Balban Parak Center for General Semantics and other human sciences. <coughs> in terms of the promotion of the study of human sciences at a time when the discipline under its broad rubric are sadly neglected in our universities and institutions of higher learning. At the outset, let me briefly comment upon the present state of digital technology which has radically altered the tone and tenor of human communication. Marcel, Marcel McLuhan's prophecy about the advent of a global village has come true with a sort of, with a sort of vengeance. The world seems to have shrunk in both space and time. We now live in a world where the real is too palpably close to our intelligence. One click on the mouse opens the past world to our view. What are the consequences of such instantaneous revelation, which often is mistaken for knowledge? When we discuss the topic of the communication in the 21st century, we must take into account, apart from the innumerable good things that this technology has provided for us, for instant pleasure and profit, its philosophical and epistemological consequences for years to come. On the surface, our lives have become more comfortable now than they were before. Our accessibility to sources of information has been tremendous. The social networking and political linkages have been changing the world politics and culture in a significant way. We cannot think of distancing ourselves from the technologies that have provided us such benefits. The digital revolution that swept across the globe in the, in the later part of the 20th century is perhaps the most significant event that has taken place in the world. Nothing of this kind had occurred in the past. This is the culmination, one can say, of a trajectory of transformative effort that began during the Renaissance with the invention of the printing press, a sort of an apotheosis which seems to carry within its obvious triumph, the germ of a certain hubris. I would like to speak on this point, as it has concerned <coughs> us who consider ourselves of both the beneficiaries and the victims of this revolution. A brief history of this technological transformation is in order here. Through the history of human civilization, communicating with the world has been the primary impulse of mankind. This is the chief mode of communication of the speech which was equated with God. But gradually and systematically, it was supplemented with other modes, of which writing was a good example. Socrates called writing a deformed technology that killed the spontaneity of creative communication. Through the invention of the printing press, writing proliferated and brought about a significant revolution in communication. Writing took many forms and shapes, including pictorial form, and created literacy among people with the development of civilization. Writing became the dominant mode of communication, but it also divided human beings into between those who could write and those who could not. The ability to write and to communicate through writing was considered the hallmark of civilization. But it also became the first example of communication through a device that required an external instrument like a pen or a pencil for, inscri for inscription. As the writing instrument was artificially devised, which separated itself from natural speech. Unregulated speech was repressed, 
for a long time until its revival in the digital age in the, in the later part of the 20th century. But the kind of speech that has proliferated these days through the various electronic devices is different from the natural speech that Socrates had praised and stood for. The present speech disseminated through these devices could be called mere gibberish, having very little creative potential. But this trajectory is irrevocable. There is nothing, there is no turning back to an imaginary pre lapsarian time before the fall. But the fall, in the biblical sense, is fortunate, a Felix Kolpa. One can only look ahead through, the looking, through looking back. Kojibiski's notion of time binding seems to provide an answer to the predicament of mankind at a critical juncture in history. We are at the cusp, the pointed end of a journey, which implies that a turning back could be a turning point. Therefore, the stage where we have reached in our journey also provides us with a sumptuous hindsight, which we must exploit to our advantage. Philosophers and prophets have been giving us hints from time to time that we must beware of the visible world we behold, McLuhan. To McLuhan, the discovery of electricity and its subsequent utilization into modes of communication technology brought about a paradigm shift in our thinking about our environment, which gradually under the impact of electric light turned into an automaton that tried to trap the human beings into a self-enclosed world of dark interiority. The, his uh, his opposed statement medium is the message which, with a heavy fun on the phonetic implication of the word message, which also sounds like massage, suggests that the massage that, the message that comes from an external device is thoroughly and often painfully determined by its sender, whose identity gets conflated with what, is, what it disseminates. This is a grave warning for human beings who are reckless and impulsive in the reification of technology. The moral of the story is this. One needs to be cautious and careful in handling the gadgets we have produced so that we do not get dehumanized in a blind adoration and subsequent appropriation by the medium we have created. The story of Frankenstein could be served as an in instructive example parable. Such people may think, some people may think that these ominous forebodings are expressions of self-inflicted pessimism. But the sober reflection made with some sense of detachment could indicate that these prognostications are in fact profound indicators of the coming times. By the excessive use of medium, for our pleasure, we have sold our soul, like Faustus sold his, to the devil of media technology. Too harsh, but deliberately I chose these words to make the point clear. The irony of the situation is that we are unable to see the danger lurking behind the spectacle of this temptation. We are blinded by vision, as McIlwain implied, and hence do not understand the distinction between the real and its simulacrum in its pervasive glare. In an important essay called The Extress of Communication, John Baudria expresses a similar sentiment more poignantly. For him, the communication revolution in the wake of the electronic media has made our life schizophrenic because it has made the real obscenely, obscenely palpable, to quote him. Thus, at bottom, the message already no longer exists. It is the medium that imposes itself in its pure circulation. This is what I call potentially ecstasy. Ecstasy is a form of madness when an unsuspecting being is possessed by a spirit that doesn't allow him or her to know the difference between object and its representation. We are now possessed by the specter of digital technology. These are proleptic visions, which from the vantage, prole proleptic visions made from the vantage point of hindsight when we are moving forward by going backward. What are some of the effects of this spectral presence of our inner consciousness on our consciousness and thought. We have certainly lost the capacity for cool reflection, for narrative skills to organize our shatter imaginary selves into some form of coherence. Our mind is jumbled with facts called from digital memory on which we depend more than on our natural biological memory. Even as Victor Mayer Schoenberger says in his recent book, called Delict, 
the virtue of forgetting in a digital age published in 2009, we have lost the capacity for forgetting. He suggests that in order to restore our biological memory to its creative function, we need to delete from our jumbled consciousness the useless information we have acquired from our infatuation with the medium we have inserted into ourselves. He says, comprehensive digital remembering collapses history, impairing our judgment and our capacity to act in time. It denies us humans the chance to evolve, develop, and learn, leaving us completely oscillating between two equally troubling questions, permanent past and ignorant present. These are the signs of the time we must act against. We are now in a world where the virtual library created with a click on the mouse on a computer screen has replaced the real library. There's no need now to search assiduously for material to a careful reading of a real book. It is available now on command. The pleasure of holding a book and feeling its texture, smell, and weight Wait, it's slowly giving way to a vicarious satisfaction of a job done without much effort. Collective reading culture in a library is fast disappearing. And with that, the whole world of humanistic learning. The ready-made information available electronically has replaced what Nicholas Carr says, the slow excavation of knowledge. As Carr says, we are mentally in perpetual locomotion. Learning at a slow pace gives us the capacity for reflection, which is the source of creativity. Civilizations have been sustained by the spirit. In practical world of digital technology deployed for immediate material benefits, reading literature and philosophy, which requires, us, requires lots of time and concentration, has become a low priority for those who crave for excellence, within quote, excellence in result-oriented economy. Even some well-meaning scholars and educators seem to think that a live classroom today is an anachronism. A virtual classroom without teachers and live discussion face to face is beginning to replace the old classroom with a blackboard, piece of chalk, and the presence of a teacher before a group of students. This is perhaps the worst scenario confronting us. In a provocative book called Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities, 2010, the philosopher Martha Nussbaum says that if, we, if you jettison the old virtues of humanistic learning and replace them with the professional training, our democratic culture will be weakened because democracy needs the humanities and the live discourse it engenders in the classroom for its survival and prevalence. In a new electronic classroom, there is little space for the positive stillness of deep reading and the fuzzy interaction of contemplation, Nicholas Carr says. A system, gives, a system that gives ready-made knowledge without any serious and painstaking search doesn't offer the benefit of what he calls the fuzzy interaction of contemplation that leads to moments of creative discovery. Carr comments, the great danger we face as we become more intimately involved with our computers is that we begin to lose our humanness to sacrifice the very qualities that separate us from machines. His book is interestingly called Salos. We have become Salos. Kojibiski's notion of abstracting is like deep reading in a pensive stillness of reading room. As you experience an event, we instantly abstract it through, our, uh, through, through the innate biological mechanism of a nervous system. In the subsequent stages, the bio this biological abstraction which is pre-verbal is transformed into the lower abstraction through its association with our verbal mechanism when we begin to perceive the complexity of an event. In this mode of understanding, which is attained through a conscious effort, we come to terms with the world. At this level, we are deluded by the power of words and their affective qualities, but in an inner vision, but by an inner vision that is hidden behind the blanket of words. Hariel Weinberg describes this state as, as if it is a state of epiphany in an eloquent passage which I want to quote here. Literally, says Weinberg, a new world is discovered. A new set of semantic reactions become possible. There's nothing magical about this, though sometimes the results seem to be. 
it is not hypnosis or hallucination or anything abnormal. Rather, it is the discovery of powers of abstraction only dimly experienced previously because they had been buried under the smoldering blanket of words. This is the world of the artist and the poet, the portal to mystic experience and transcendental vision which great works of art, literature and music can evoke going beyond the words into the object that the previous speaker was talking about, two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is similar to what Hamlet says to Horatio before his death, absent thee from felicity a while, and ends his speech with the words, rest in silence, that is what the last words of Hamlet, or what William Wordsworth calls the sense of sublime, of something far more deeply interfused in his poem called the Tintern Abbey. Hamlet, as a humanist, was deeply disturbed by the dilemma that he faced in trying to resolve how a man full of thought can also be an active performer. I would like to complete these thoughts in a somewhat light-headed manner by reflecting on the recent death of Steve Jobs, who after achieving spectacular success with the Apple computer system passed away, passed into history, I can say. In a jocular vein, my two techno-savvy nephews told me, techno-savvy nephews told me after his death that the Apple has made revolutions twice, thrice. The first revolution was made when Eve ate the apple under the seductive persuasion of Satan. The second revolution came when the apple fell on Newton's head. And perhaps the third and final revolution had signal, was signaled by the invention of the Apple computer. Although stated jocularly, there is something profound in their observation, which has, wh whoever has made it first. The first apple is implicated with the fortunate fall, the second with scientific worldview, and the third with a technocrat technocratic vision. This here is a trajectory of systematic transformation of thought. The original apple in the book of Genesis was only a poetic metaphor, which eventually transformed itself into an apt signature of an impending technology. This is how a poetic symbolism provided inspiration for a technocrat, who in his own way brought about a creative alliance between a nomenclature and the traces of its past association. Steve Jobs' life's history, as Maureen Dodd in a recent uh, New York Times article describes, is like a plot in a Shakespearean play, involving separation, disguise, and finally reconciliation. Steve's novelist sister, Mona Simpson, who Steve met for many first time when they were adults, in a novel called The Regular Guy, 1996, fictionalizes her family history with her brother as the chief protagonist. And in so doing, redeems her technocratic brother from the schizophrenic life he was living by making him a figure in art. Steve's discovery of his, of his sister's creative talent provided him with an ample <coughs> recompense for the lack in him that he did not perceive until this discovery. Thus, this reconciliation of hard technology-driven mind with someone on the other side of the spectrum is a marvelous example of how a hardcore technocrat who does need the bliss of solitude and the sucker of heart for making his life self-fulfilling. With this, I stop. I do not want to say something about the two centers, which I have already said uh, before. And uh, this is the last point that I wanted to make, that technology and the humanism, art, can go together. We are not making a case that we must uh, throw away computers and mobile phones and internets and go back to a pre luxian days when there was everything all right happening in the human civilization. We must deal with them uh, humanistically. And this is the example I chose, that Steve Jobs in the latter part, later part of his life chose and discovered Mona, his sister, and in this kind of fictus, fictional encounter between the brother and the sister, after 27 years of you know, discovery, that perhaps redeemed the technology-driven brother through this magic touch of art and humanism. And that is what I want to say. Thank you very much.